Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the final segment part of uh, Finding Me in the ITV Networks with me today is Professor Ramos. And before we went into the break, of course, I was just regurgitating the, the, the constructed social fears, the constructed social fears, of course, that all black people are inferior, that all Muslims are terrorists, that black people cannot rule, that if you have black people in government, then of course, you're bound to have an authoritarian system. But Professor Ramos, uh, are we in a democracy? Do we have, have we shifted from an authoritarian system in South Africa post? 94 are we in a democracy or I see in one of your writings here you write your article the death of democracy and the resurrection of democracy maybe perhaps you can explain that a little bit more and confirm for me this shift from parliament to constitutional supremacy is it reaffirming the stereotype that we cannot have black people in power thank you um, <coughs> well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sure that uh, uh, some people understand Africans. And so I, I'm going to use Africans to degrees of comparison when you learn, when you are a little child. So uh, one of the Africans uh, uh, expressions, it doesn't mean only Africaners hold on to that, but when they do degrees of comparison, uh, in view of the changes since 1994, what do they say in terms of trape van vergelijking, as yes, they say yes, in Africa? Yes, okay. <laughs> they say bantu, tronktu, parlementu. <laughs> no. <All right. laughs> I got that one. <laughs> okay. No, it, it, it tells. All right, yeah, yeah. we will pass that one. <laughs> the story is clear. Yeah. It's clear that there's going to be a mess in parliament yes. because you know they were oh. bantus, they go to prison, and now you put them in parliament. What do you expect? Yeah. You must be mad. So we leave that one aside. Mm -hmm. And then we come to the points I mentioned earlier that actually this, this euphoria about democracy is actually unjustified because we actually hiding the reality. The reality is that at the time when uh, uh, so-called democracy was ushered in, in 1994, at that very time, even before, we already globally had democracy. The, e the, the, the economic sovereigns of this world are the actual rulers, not the people elected into parliament. Those ones are still subject to the rule of the unelected economic sovereigns. And these are the ones who hold money power. So for the benefit of the viewers, when you say unelected economic sovereigns, you're speaking about the multinational corporations, the banking system, the exactly. financing, exactly. the monopoly capital. Exactly. <laughs> these are the ones who rule. And uh, it's, uh, that's why I link them to sovereignty, because popular and normal uh, standard political science tells us that sovereignty is vested in the people, people yes. and it is conditionally transferred to a government that they have elected. Mm -hmm. Now, business does not stand for elections, yet it has got much more power than those who are elected and do than those who even elect. That's why I call them economic sovereigns. Mm -hmm. Aha. Okay, so these economic sovereigns, then, when they have so much more power, are they still playing a role in South Africa, basically con controlling the economic wealth of this country and dictating policy? In fact, they continue <clears throat> to do so. First, they did it by the very many secret meetings they have had mm -hmm. with those that they met. If you follow these three texts, there is a trilogy of books these days, which uh, I think are very important. And please, uh, one, please. one is by Alistair Sparks. It is called uh, Tomorrow is Another Country. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is by Professor Sam Peter Blanche. Lost. It is called Lost in Transformation. Mm -hmm. Another one is by mm -hmm. Professor Esther Ezef, initially written in Afrikaans, and now it is also available in English as End Game. Okay. This trilogy of books tells you exactly who met where, when, and why. And of course, we mustn't forget to add to this another fourth one, and we will make it a quartet, and that is by John Pilger. It is called Freedom Next Time. 
And that tells you, you that, that actually, <clears throat> no, those who had money wanted to make sure that their money will be protected. And so they will have to dictate the terms before you go to Codesa. By the time you go to Codesa, you're just rehearsing what you have already been instructed to do. Of course, you will call it negotiations yes. for, for the sake of... For the benefit. Exactly, the benefit. but it is, you know, carrying out the instructions. Mm -hmm. And so, precisely because the, even the shift from parliamentary to, uh, to, to constitutional supremacy was actually dictated, well, what do we have? What do we have? We have the same people continuing to control. I am even tempted to say that, you know, I would want to agree with Ali Mazrui and say, ha, huh, you see, a independence in Africa, political independence, precisely because it denied it denied this base of economic independence mm -hmm. exactly for that reason is best described as transition from slavery by coercion to slavery by consent and this is where we are that is that is where intense we are. but I, I want to take it to one last discussion because I think we're just we're just opening the debates here and sure. we can we can take it further. Yeah. Considering that we're now in slavery by consent. by consent, um, we're going to stay there for as long as we do not actually transform. And one of the key areas that requires transformation is the education system, whether it's in the curricula. Uh, the academics who teach the curricula and even the, in terms of the quota system, the amount of students that you're allowing into your universities. So are universities places for transformation? And is there transformation happening in South African universities? Let's go back to the constitution on the so-called clauses of group rights. You know, yes. when, even when you don't read the constitution, when you just look at it, there is very one very long clause. And normally long clauses are devoted to the suspension of basic human rights. Okay. But this one, the longest clause is about property rights. So you can ask yourself, who has been owning property in this country for the last three centuries? And whose property is being protected by the Constitution? It is not only that. It is also under the uh, <coughs> a, a rubric of group rights, where you see that Universities have their right to uh, claim cultural rights. In other words, I will therefore teach in Afrikaans. I will therefore teach in Zulu. I will therefore teach in that. In other words, the protection of a specific paradigm mm -hmm. is already there. So universities, technically speaking, are not obliged to transform if you get my point, yes. because you already have recourse to the Constitution to say, oh, but he is saying I should transform. I'm exercising my right to keep to my paradigm, and it is better expressed in English or in Afrikaans. If you want to, to transform, you're free. Do it in your Zulu. Do it in Botswana. What's wrong with you? You see? Yes. So in that way, there is already an inbuilt constitutional legal mechanism to preempt dialogical encounters of epistemologies in a way that an encounter of this pluriversality of epistemologies will finally lead to something new that is qualitatively transformative. As far as I can see now, universities are literally unius one version of something, one version of an epistemological paradigm. Mm. I guess the, we need to entertain the idea that now universities must change name and become pluriversities, like the panepistemio. Mm. They must now become panepistemic. And panepistemio will exactly refer to the pluriversality of epistemologies, where there is the melting pot of interaction and where actually something will emerge. 
And you can see that even that speaks to the Ubuntu idea of ness. And therefore... But those who control the institutions, and we cannot say that the state controls it because there is so much external funding from corporates, nationals, lobby groups, etc. Yeah. They don't want this alternate dialogue. They don't want these diverse epistemologies. They don't want this pluri knowledge to come into the universities. True. So will there ever be transformation then? Or unless is it going to be that the people have to go to the streets again? Well, the people are already in the streets. Because the strikes tell us something. Yes. The people don't have to wait for academics. One of the biggest prompters is the stomach. Yes. And so, if the stomach is empty, necessity will know no law. We have learned that already from Shakespeare's Coriolanus, for those who want to read relaxed literature. <laughs> they will see that. You see, even if people claim wrongly, I must insist, that the masses do not analyze. The masses actually analyze from the point of view of an empty stomach. Mm. And those who analyze from the point of view of a full stomach will have to realize that erecting barriers uh, so that they remain the other side is simply inviting the analysis of those with an empty stomach to be curious to see what is being behind the wall. Mm -hmm. So there is no place of safety. This reminds me of, of Kennedy's inaugural speech when he took over as president of the United States. He, towards the end of his speech, he stated that, you know, if the rich cannot help the many who are poor. I use the word help. If the rich cannot help the many who are poor, they cannot save the few who, who are, are rich. rich. <laughs> so we all in the same boat. We all in the same uh, our humanness demands pluriversality. The pluriversization of the universities so that they become pan-epistemic. Mm -hmm. And they must understand. And also, at the same time, in general democratic discourse, we need a pluriversality of views. Nobody should be excluded. Let all the voices be heard. After all, we are all so human. Not only that, if you're confident about your voice, it won't get drowned, isn't it? It won't get drowned. Exactly. So now we're in the final. We've got like about a minute for you to conclude for me. Tell me why this title, I Doubt Therefore African Philosophy, exists. Yes, the point of the title is to show that in spite of everything else, there is still skepticism about whether or not African philosophy exists. I know there are, if you think in color terms, there are uh, black Africans with a white mind. That I know. But I also know that there are black Africans with a black mind. And so, even in terms of quantity, in terms of training, I'm one of those who can be pointed at as a black philosopher. So why the skepticism? Why, even quantitatively speaking, do you still doubt when we claim liberation? But when we speak philosophy, and, and if you look at Descartes, and you look at the main philosophers or whatever, they don't say that's a white philosopher, so white black philosopher. Oh, there is no philosophy and there has never been a philosophy without a cultural context. <laughs> never. Okay. And so being black in the world is already an expression of a specific philosophical point of view, just like there is meaning in being white in the world. Mm -hmm. And this is the type of meaning that we are supposed to all assimilate and accept as the only meaning and truth about what it means to be human. Right. So that's why I doubt, therefore, African philosophy exists. Yes, it is to challenge exactly the point that you can never just have one meaning. Do away with your skepticism and you will see that you have to be scientific, you have to be philosophical. To be philosophical is to learn first to listen to the other mm -hmm. before you even attempt an answer. And that's an excellent point to end on. So I'd like to say thank you very much for being here and for sharing these 
particularly interesting discussions with me. I know it's raised a lot of questions and a lot of people will be forced to think about what you have said and hopefully will raise a generation who are now going to have inquiring minds. Don't just sit back and accept the status quo. Status quo. Sorry, it's time to challenge the status quo. So thank you very much, Professor Amose, for being here and for sharing these viewpoints with me. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. And then with that, I'll say, Fiyamanila, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.